I think you could keep your mic because we are we are, we are now heading into how do you protect your intellectual property? How do you actually go ahead and apply for certain intellectual property rights for the rights that we've mentioned so far? Again, just to refresh everyone, we are speaking about copyright, we are speaking about trademarks, we are speaking about industrial designs as the rights that are utilized mainly in protecting elements or costume design, festival design and stuff like that, right? Copyright being for the artwork and stuff like that. Trademarks being for the, the brand naming, the brand names for certain shapes, for unique shapes, and also for industrial designs for the, again, also for unique aesthetic creations. All right, so I will turn over to Dion, who will continue for the next few slides, and then I'll take over after. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And I hope that you're well. From the questions I'm, I'm getting, you all are engaged, and, and thank you for, you know, your feedback and your participation so far, because, you know, you make it fun. Okay, so how to protect copyright and related rights. I saw one of the comments in the chat from Athea, and I'm wondering if that is Antifia. But Antifia made a comment not legally copyrighted. And so I think we want to use that as a jump off point to get into this. So in the chat, tell me, do you think, tell me yes or no, does copyright... And I mean, the answer is right there, right? <laughs> so let me not ask the question because you see any answer. I'm giving it away. A copyright is something that protects the creator's original work, but no, app, no red application or registration is required for copyright to exist in a work. So when we say that it is not legally copyrighted, it makes me ask, what do we mean by that? And I feel that what may be the, the thinking is that it may, may have to be registered with somebody like CUT. We may be aware of CUT, that is the Copyright Music Organization of Trinidad and Tobago. They are a copyright management organization. And what they do is they help copyright owners to manage their rights. Consider you have created a song Consider you have painted, um, you've painted a piece of a, a, a painting, you've made a painting, and it's distributed broadly, widely throughout the world. Do you, as a single individual, have the ability to um, follow up upon every user of your work to receive whatever royalties or dues or um, whatever royalties that might be due for you, due to you for the use of your work? Probably not. This is where collective management organizations come in, right? And so I think where people get confused or maybe slightly um, mixed up is that as a member of a copyright management organization, you do register your works with them. And so it is a way of managing your, your creative works and having someone, giving somebody the right to collect on your behalf and then to distribute your, your monies earned to you. But in order for the copyright protection to come, to, to, to be um, enacted, and for, enacted rather, you do not need a, either an application or registration. Copyright is automatic. So if that is one thing that you leave this, this um, session with today, I would be happy that we are now aware of the clarity that copyright does not have to be registered for it to be legally protected. However, what is required is for the copyright to, to, to be protected is for the work to be original, for there to be some measure of creativity and that it is fixed. So your idea that is flying around in your head, it is not fixed. Your idea that you have shared orally with someone it is not fixed unless that sharing has been recorded. Then you can say it has been fixed. Fixed as in put in a, a set place where you can retrieve it and make it in a, basically have it in a tangible form, so to speak. Right. Um, one of the ways that you can put the world on notice that you own the copyright in a particular piece of artwork, in a song, in a film, in a book, and you would have seen it. In, in things that you would have interacted with in pieces of copyright that you would have acted, interacted with before is using what we call the either copyright notice or the copyright legend. And that is the copyright um, symbol, which is the C in a circle. 
the name of the creator, the year created, and all rights reserved, right? So um, basically the four components, the copyright symbol or the word copyright, the date, the author's name, and the statement of rights, right? The statement of rights, however, is not a requirement because by default, copyright notice will work to reserve all of your rights. So stating something like all rights reserved isn't technically necessary. It's a little redundant, but for me, clarity always wins. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's it's commonly seen, and you know, as I said, clarity of your rights cannot hurt. And uh, as I said, the C and the um circle is the universally accepted symbol for copyright. What cannot be protected by copyright, as I said before, Proce ideas, procedures, discoveries, mere data. So you have phone numbers, legislative texts, official translations, political speeches, speeches delivered in the course of legal proceedings. This last one here may differ dependent on territory, right? Um, in terms of the political speeches and, and speeches delivered in the course of legal proceedings, political speeches in particular. Um, so these cannot be protected by copyright, right? But you may then want to ask, okay, so if I can't register my copyright, how am I going to prove that it's mine? Okay, so this is where you get your administrative juices flowing. Or if you don't have administrative juices, you get somebody that you trust to be administrative for you, right? People that know me know that I always speak to creatives needing a team, you can't do all things by on your own, right? So how you prove that the work is yours? Record keeping. This shows the progress of your work. You're writing a song. You're sketching a design. So you maybe were you at the beach and you're having a lovely bacon shark and you're looking at the water and you've got this beautiful idea for this, this costume that speaks of water and, you know, what the sea means to you or being at the seaside means to you. And you do a quick sketch on the napkin from... Um, from the bacon shark. You keep that because that's a draft. You put your name, you put the copyright, you put the date on it. You keep that. You go home and you refine that, you reiterate, etc. All your drafts, you keep it together. Record who you share your work with. I shared my work with Betty. You take a note of that. And what that is doing is providing records that are made contemporaneously with your actions that can be used as evidence to prove that the work is yours later down. We also encourage the use of confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements. And of course, the copyright notice, as I, as I said before, sharing your work with others. And this, is, this depends on the nature of the sharing as well, right? Um, confidentiality and NDA agreements um, I'm not going to say that we have to pull it out every time before we speak to somebody, but once you um, intend um, on sharing proprietary information that you intend to use in your business strategy, then it might make a good um, a good idea to a good idea to um, um, have it use have to utilize it once it's 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 speaking to big business. Sorry, I got distracted by the chat there a minute. And then we we probably have heard of poor person's copyright, the poor man's copyright. And this is this is where you basically put your idea in a fixed. You express the idea in a fixed way. So your sketches on the paper that that napkin that you had, the two three drafts after that, and the final one. All of them have the copyright notice on the bottom of it. You send that to yourself by registered mail and you keep it unopened. Should the need arise where you feel your copyright has been infringed, you can now pull this out and give it to your attorney to present to the courts to indicate, here is my proof of, of um, the date of creations, et cetera, et cetera, a timeline that you can follow, right? And why I say by registered mail is because you have now a third party who has proof of the fact that you mailed it, right? They would have records and data. 
to indicate, right? Confidentiality agreements are very important. Yes, I'm seeing Sharon saying in the chat. Yes, they are. And the confidentiality in, um, um, agreements can actually be used within your team. So for instance, you're starting out your band, you know what your your um, theme is for this year, you're about to start planning, et cetera. It would be a good time to have your team sign some confidentiality agreements, noting that you'd be sharing proprietary information, noting that the information, if gotten out, could be could um cause you to suffer great financial loss. And therefore, should there be the reason that you suffered such financial loss, they would be in a little bit of a pickle having some um liability to face. Yeah. Because they would have breached the confidentiality agreement. So your employees, the employees of the band, um, the the mass band, um you know, partners that you may that may be investing with you, etc., who maybe have sight either of your databases, have sight of your sketches, have sight of, of things that are um of proprietary importance to your business strategy. Definitely you want to make sure that those things are protected by way of either the confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements. Right. And then there's a voluntary copyright registration system. So um that speaks to things like the co collective management organizations or also, some in some jurisdictions, there are repositories. There are depositories where you can actually um, deposit your, your um, fixed expressions of, of the copyright that you own. And so there's a third party that has um, possession and control over a particular time and or a register of what you have owned, right? We want to talk about who is the copyright owner. And this is something that, um, in my experience, has been a little ticklish. And it got more ticklish when we got more savvy on the internet. And we started to download American agreements with the term work for hire, right? And we went about thinking that if I hire, so this is coming back even to the question of that was asked, Forgive me, I forgot the name, but that was asked about the ownership of the trademark if you gave somebody concept and they designed the artwork. So artwork, we remembered, was one of the areas under copyright, right? One of the works covered under copyright. And the general rule contained in our Copyright Act, and we're speaking to our Caribbean jurisdictions here, and generally we are... Um, our acts are compatible, but I would suggest that should you not um and, and our acts are the acts are available online, right? Um, so we can do a quick comparison if we need to. But if you're speaking to to Trinidad and Tobago, the Copyright Act provides that the original owner of copyright is the person who created the work. Where a work is created in the course of employment, the copyright owner is the employer. Where there's a work for hire, you're probably a freelance artist. You are a freelance, um, you're co doing costume design, like let's say Andrea, in, when she first started out, you're doing costume design as a freelance person. You're not hired, you're not employed by the band. You're a freelancer, you're an independent contractor. In that case, the copyright belongs to you as the designer. It does not belong to the band unless and until there is a transferring of that right. It is not, we do not have in our, in our body of law work for hire where copyright is concerned. So even though I have hired you, I've paid you, you've given me a receipt, confirming receipt, um, receipt of the payment, Unless that receipt also carries with it language to suggest I, I, the artist, are now transferring all my copyright to you, the person who is paying me. You, the person who hired, will not be able to um, register the trademark because you don't yet own it. What would be required is some form of transfer, whether by assignment, which I would suggest, if you're going to own the mark, it would have to be an assignment, which is a full um, transfer of rights and another way we do is, is by license but we'll go through that a little later right so you own the copyright if you created it or if you were commissioned to create it and ownership hasn't been transferred if ownership has been transferred you don't own it 
you don't own it also if it was created in the course of employment. So you're working for um, Nicholas's mass band and he's paying you on a contract where he's covering your tax, he's covering NIS, he's covering um, health surcharge, i.e. you're an employee, then you don't own what you create. You could sketch from now till kingdom come until you're employed by yourself um, or you're, you're operating on your own. Once you are in the course of employment, whatever you create belongs to your employer, right? Book designed, that would be copied under, covered under copyright as well, Nicole. So the layout of a book, that would also be covered under copyright. Typesetting and those things. Um, okay, so some important um, information is how long is the work protected by copyright? I mean, how long do I have to make this, to make use of this exclusive right that I have? When Trinidad and Tobago, copyright is protected generally for, for the life of the author and 50 years after death. Um, and related or neighboring rights 50 years after the performance, recording or broadcast has taken place. In Barbados, it's the life of, life of the author and plus 50 years after the death, similarly for um, related or neighboring rights. Jamaica, due to the... <laughs> proliferation of Bob Marley's music and reggae in particular decided to increase the life of their copyrights so that they could continue to generate revenue or to earn revenue from the works of persons that would have passed who would have been the stalwarts of the reggae movement, etc. Right? Making that work not yet available in the public space, in the public domain, right? Once the rights have expired, then a work is said to be in the public domain. So Jamaica, their copyright is the life of the author plus 95 years after death. And in relation to related and neighboring rights, 95 years after the broadcast has taken place, right? The rights that subsist in copyright, the exclusive rights that you have, they fall in two categories, economic rights. Those are the rights that make you money, right? <laughs> that they have, they have to pay you to use and your moral rights. And your moral right is the, your right to be identified prominently as the author of the work, your credits, right? And we know that in the creative space, our credits are very important. Our credits are our calling cards. Our credits is how we get work. Right. And so you want to be credited for that purpose, but you also want to be credited. So when collective management organizations are doing their work. Yeah. You are listed as a copyright owner. Now, I'm speaking now co co collective management organizations. Let me say specifically in Trinidad and Tobago, we have. um. We have strong representation in the music area and the reprographic rights area, which is text, etc. We also have an organization that is set up, I believe, to represent works of mass. Yeah. Um, I would have to do some digging to see, you know, where that organization is at the moment, but so that is something that we could come back to. Right. But your moral rights basically protects you from being um not identified as the author of the work, or you can determine that I don't want to be um identified, right? Which is actually the case of, um, was the case of the writers of the song that Nicholas spoke to, um, their name actually being ghostwriters, right? <laughs> so, um, or to use a pseudonym as 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 they did, or to object to any derogatory treatment of your work. So. With the moral rights, you can say, no, I don't want you to. When you do a cover of my song, you cannot change that to that. When you are, if you are using my costume um, and I've intended it to be used in this particular way, no, you cannot use it in this particular way that I think is derogatory, right? So it's based on the um, objective view of the owner of the right. You can waive your moral rights, but to do so, it must be um, in writing and the right that is being waived, which is, you know, you're not, um, 
looking to enforce it must be specifically in, in identified. The circumstances in respect of the wa waiver applies must also be stated um, and clear, right? And of course, it must be signed so that um, there is evidence. <laughs> Your signature is the evidence of you agreeing to it, right? I'll turn over now to Nicholas. Let me just check to see if there's anything in the chat that I need to address. Yes, I wasn't seeing it on there. Um, okay, so let me just see if I can engage something here. If a designer is hired by an author to design a book, is it that the content is copyright to the author and design copyright belong to the designer? Yes. The design copyright would have to be transferred to the owner. To the author, sorry, and or rather to the publisher, because sometimes it might be the publisher that is doing the artwork, right? So it depends on what. It, um, um. Oh, I thought it was answered. Sorry. Okay, so Nicholas, I think you can go ahead now and speak to us about how to protect industrial designs. You all, you're getting it from an examiner, technical examiner. So take good notes. Thank you very much. Okay, so. I'm going to quickly go through the, the industrial designs and the trademarks as well, because we still have a, a, a bit to cover and um, I know time is on us. So how do you go about protecting your industrial design? So you make, a dis you make an application, right? You come to the intellectual property office or the respective intellectual property office that you want to get the, the, the protection for, uh, in the jurisdiction that you want to get the protection for, I'm sorry and you make an application. So for Trinidad and Tobago, you can make an application in one of two ways. You can make an application in person by having completed the application form, by having pictures or views of the design that you want to get protected and um, having all of these in duplicate. Or you can do an electronic filing. We are very proud to say that we have we accept electronic filing of not just industrial designs, but also of trademarks as well, all right? So I'm not gonna go through, is there an office in Tobago? No, so the office is in Trinidad at the moment. We are working on having a, a, an expansion, but uh, more to come when, when that actually happens. At the moment, uh, the office in Trinidad services both Trinidad, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, right? If that makes sense. We're one country, but you know what I mean, right? So. Um, you can do an electronic filing where we're trying to we're trying to push and encourage more persons to utilize the electronic filing system. It's a lot easier, and um, you will be given copies of this presentation. However, what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to put a link in the chat to our video tutorial on how you can go about making an application for industrial design rights electronically. All right. But to explain the traditional one, like I said, we look for two copies of the application form. You can download the application form on our website, ipo.gov.tt, and um, you will fill out the relevant information. Who is the applicant? Who is the name of the person? The address? And also, if you have additional applicants, um, whether the, you are being represented by an attorney, who is the actual creator of the design. If the creator is different to the applicant, we require things like a statutory declaration stating that the applicant has the right to apply for this design. And yeah, again, this is, this is how assign, uh, assigning your rights would work in this case. We also ask for graphic representations, which is what I mentioned before. Your pictures, your images that are going to describe exactly in detail the design that you want protection over and this is an example of how some graphic representations would look like and also how some drawings and tracings would look like you can also provide a specimen but that's not necessary we we, we much prefer the graphic representations or the drawings or you could also submit photographs as well but we ask that the photographs be against a clean background uh, on the application form, you describe the product that you are uh, you wish to to get protected, whether it's a joint application. So in the case of like a board game, where you would have the board itself, the playing surface, and maybe like the figurines or the tokens that you would use, you would put that in here, and um, 
well, we don't need to know anything about priority and deferred application at the moment. And then the supplemental boxes, additional information, whether you have additional creators, whether you have additional applicants, and then of course you sign. So this form is much more simpler on the electronic, uh, the electronic vision and the electronic filing vision. So that's why I would I would actually um, encourage persons to check out the electronic filing. And again, I put the link in the chat so you could go check that out. As I would have mentioned earlier, we examine based on novelty, meaning that this is a new design. And um, we also examine based on whether the, the, the design is immoral or not. And we also examine on whether the design is solely a functional design. All right. So if it's a solely functional design, it would not be granted industrial design protection. It has to be a uh, pure aesthetic creation just a quick example of the fees to apply just to apply for an industrial design right it's 500 tt dollars and um, this allows you to apply for multiple variations so let's just say the the costume design um there's a variation where okay maybe the the wing has 20 20 feathers or one has 25 or one has a branch of a, a smaller wing branching all from the main wing so these are would all be variations of the original costume design you can apply for multiple variations of this costume design uh for the all for the one sole price of 500 tt dollars can payments be made online for persons yes you can make payments online as well right this is also why we push the electronic filing system because you could basically handle everything online uh, payments as well. Jurisdiction. This is very important with respect to industrial design and for trademarks as well. Intellectual property rights are territorial. You obtain protection in the territory you apply for that protection in. So if you apply for industrial design rights or trademark rights in Trinidad and Tobago, it's valid in Trinidad and Tobago only. As that's just an example. If you apply for it. In Barbados, it's valid in Barbados only. If you apply for it in the US, it's valid in the US only. All right. Now you are not sick. You are not. You are not. I'm breaking. Am I breaking up? Sorry. Actually, you are not. You can apply for rights in multiple jurisdictions. All right. You are not. You don't have to just settle for one territory. You can apply for rights in multiple jurisdictions. All right. So don't be scared that well, I only you're only allowed to choose one territory. You can choose multiple territories. All right. There are different ways in which you could do that, which is something I will explain in the trademark application aspect of it. Um if you're going to export your product to another country, you have to apply in that country. Yes, you should. Because you would want to ensure that you could enforce your intellectual property rights in that country as well. So there's a little bit of strategy when it comes to applying for intellectual property rights, which is something we would probably like to cover in a more advanced session. But yes, if you are choosing, if your market is Trinidad, Barbados, and the US, for example, it would mean, and this is where you export to and stuff like that, it would, it would be better for you if you have inter, inter, your intellectual property rights in these three territories as well okay so you have a 24 piece fashion design collection that is 500 where 24 can you register collection as one okay so if the 24 piece uh fashion design collection is variations of the same design then you can include it in one application for 500 tt this is for the industrial design if it's completely different designs, then it would be different applications. Okay, it has to be variations of the same design. Does TTIPO help with exporting? No, we do not help with exporting. However, we would provide as much information as possible in terms of um, strategies for or at least helping you decide on whether or not you should apply in certain countries. All right, but in terms of the actual exporting aspect of it, no, we do not help with the exporting aspect of it. So um, much like the, um, the industrial designs, we have an online trademark application process for trademarks. And again, I'm going to put the 
the link in the chat for you all. I would have mentioned in a previous slide that when you when trademarks are examined, they are examined again to, to see if the, the marks are distinctive and to ensure they're not generic, they are not descriptive, and to ensure that they are not immoral. All right. So just a quick view of the application process. Uh, when you make an application, it is examined based on formality. So to make sure that you fill out the forms uh, properly, it's classified. Uh, a search is done to ensure that it is distinctive. It is then examined against the, the, the criteria that I would have mentioned previously. It's published and for a period of three months, which allows persons to oppose the mark. If the mark is opposed, then you would proceed to have to defend whether or not this mark should be granted or not. If it's not opposed, it goes to registration and then you could renew after 10 years. So it's just literally just a quick rundown on the process because I don't want to spend too much time. I know we have um, the contract terms that we want to go over, but I will invite you all to explore the web, the links to the website that we are posting in the chat as well. That would take you to information and further videos that would further break down these processes. Now, the tra for a trademark, if you want to apply in multiple jurisdictions at the exact at simultaneously, we have an international filing system known as the Madrid Protocol. This allows for the, the, the owner of a mark to have protection of their trademark in several countries by filing one single application to the national office, uh, utilizing one currency and one language. So this is an international filing system that is going to allow you to enter into multiple territories simultaneously. All right. Um, again, I don't want to go too in depth into it, but just to quickly overview, it allows trademark holders to protect their trademark in several countries with one single application, as opposed to making one application in Trinidad, one application in Barbados, one application in the US. Um, you can utilize the Madrid system to file in multiple countries at the exact same time. Um, I just want to actually get the, so you can access our Madrid online tools on our website as well. We have links being posted at the moment, but I just want to talk about the benefits of utilizing the Madrid protocol. And these are some of them. You have easier management of your brand portfolio through a centralized system. So you don't have to worry about, well, correspondence coming from different countries, different times. You can monitor and manage everything easier in one centralized system. It's a lot more convenient and cost effective, and it offers you uh, a route to global branding, right? To ensure or to uh, at least as much as possible enter into the markets that you wish to export to in an easy way. Um, a good example of a local mark that utilizes the Madrid system is the Carnicon mark. I'm not sure how many persons are familiar with Carnicon, but they were actually uh, one of the first to utilize the Madrid system. So that is it for me and how to go about actually making your applications. And now I would now turn you back over to Dion. Hi, everybody. How are you all doing? You all doing good? Let me know in the chat if we're good. We all right to go ahead for the next 23 minutes? Yes? All right. So we're going to talk about how you to generate revenue from your IP. So we spoke about how you could identify, we spoke about how you could protect, and now we're going to look at how you could generate revenue from what you've identified and protected. We spoke a little bit about identifying, um, well, we spoke about economic rights, right? And we spoke a little bit about transferring. Um, and so how you cash in on your economic rights and IP is by utilizing those rights. And those economic rights can be transferred for monetary or other remuneration. They can be licensed or they could be sold, right? So you, the owner of intellectual property, whether it's a trademark, a trade secret, a patent, copyright, industrial design, you can authorize or license a third party the right to use the intellectual property that you have under agreed terms and conditions. And this is what we're going to go through today. We're going to have a bit of a 
look at essential terms for agreements that you may come across in transferring or selling your um, intellectual property. So what are economic rights actually? Well, these are rights that the, the commercial rights of the copyright owner. The copyright owner or the IP owner has the exclusive right. Well, in this point, in this case, the copyright owner has the exclusive right to do, authorize, or prohibit reproduction, translation, adaptation, distribution, importation, public display, public performance, broadcasting, communication to the public of his work, and now that we have signed on to the Beijing Treaty, or the Beijing Treaty also making available, right? Which is what is happening, the right that is referred to for the streaming and so, right? That is making available and the communications to the public is, is um, more the traditional ways of utilizing. So um, Nicholas spoke a little bit about the economic contributions earlier. Actually, no, not Nicholas, Reagan in the opening, spoke a bit about the um, economic contributions and so did Karina. So when you get these slides, you can go through these details. And But just know that it's big money. And it will only get big if we do what was suggested in the video with Andrea and see it as a business and not a hustle, right? So there are a lot of licensing opportunities that you would be able to um, pursue but we're not gonna go through the opportunities today. That would be for another session that you will come on on the Connect America's platform for at another time, right? But today we wanna talk a little, a little bit about what are the things that you're looking for and how you can cash in on costume designs. So some of the ways, some of the strategies that you can employ um, display of works, merchandising opportunities through gift shops, multimedia and sensory participation, franchising opportunities, wardrobe in film and TV production. We, What I want us to also do today is think about, think a little bit more broadly about where we can go and how we can strategize with our creative capital. Our carnivals have, our carnival has birthed carnivals all over the globe. We are living in a global society. We are having this virtual um, training session. You can speak to anybody anywhere in the world at the touch of a button. You can sell to anybody anywhere in the world at the touch of a button. But what that requires is for you to have your house in order, your rights clear, documentation, et cetera. And so that's what we're hoping to get um, from today, a broader view of what, a broader awareness of what is possible through our intellectual property, right? So how are we commercializing? Um, we speak to, well, there's this video, and actually, based on the time we have, I'll allow, um, I'll ask if we could skip the industrial designs um, and just get to, um, how we actually, the, the essential contract terms that I, I really want you all to leave knowing, right? Um, because we are we are tight for time and I, I do want to make sure that you'll leave with that. Yes? Okay. But you all will be getting the slides as we said earlier on. So, and and of course you could always communicate with us should you have questions. So I want to go through some 12, 12 essential contract terms that you use when you're exploiting your IP. And I want to disabuse us of any um, negative notion that we have in relation to that word exploit. When we say exploit IT, IP, what we mean is to use it to its fullest potential. License it up the wazoo, right? Okay. So when you're drafting or entering into a contract, there are essential terms that are critical to the enforceability and implementation of your agreements. Because what you want to do is have agreements that function, not just agreements that sit in your drawer, right? You have, you want to uh, arrive at workable agreements. So let's go through some of the terms. Um, okay. The essentials that we will be looking at today 
we'll be looking at identification of the parties. Who are we contracting with? What is the purpose and the duration of the contract that we're entering to? What are the definitions that are specific to our engagement to this uh, in this arrangement? What are the operative provisions of the uh, um of the contract? Are there any grants of rights? We're speaking about transferring an assignment of intellectual property. That would be a grant of a right. What are the obligations of the parties? Are there any warranties and undertakings that we need to be um, cognizant of? What notices need to be sent and where are we sending those notices? How are we resolving disputes when they arrive? How are we ending this contract? Is it going on forever? What happens when, it's end, when it ends? Where is this contract based? Are we contracting according to Trinidad and Tobago law? Are we going to court in the US? And who are the signatories to this, right? Those are 12 things that you must, 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 must pay attention to. So let's go quickly along. Identification of party. The party is one who holds the obligation or receives the benefits of the binding agreement that they are known either as the promisor or the promisee, right? An agreement requires two or more parties. They may be individuals, a group of people, a legal entity, which would be a business, a company, or corporation. For contracts to be legally enforceable, parties must be accurately and adequately described. So you're looking for your full legal name, not tall man. Your full address, not the, not wrong the bridge by the coconut tree. Your occupations, the occupation or your status. So are you a performer? Are you a costume designer? Are you the band leader? And an identification or registration number. So if you are a person, your national ID number. If you are an entity, such as if you're registered as a business, your business registration number. If you're incorporated as a, if you're um, incorporated as a limited liability company or as a corporation, the registration number. Right, followed by the functional reference in relation to the contract. And when I say the functional reference, what is it that you're doing? So I am Dion and I am contracting with Nicholas. He has um, designed a, a carnival costume, Wanda, and I am seeking um, to provide the accessories, earrings, chains, um, to go along with this, I've you know designed a particular um, accessory line to go along with his with his um, costume, right? So in that case, my status or my functional functional reference to to me would be accessory designer or supplier, and he may, may be band owner or band producer or producer of the band, right? So you want to be able to identify your parties based on what they're doing. So any third party, any neutral party, any person foreign to the agreement that may have to read, or you yourself, if you have to remind yourself what's going on in the contract, you know who it, there's clarity, right? That's the whole purpose of putting the contract in writing. You want to arrive at ultimate clarity. Okay, so the next um, essential we will look at is purpose and duration, right? The purpose is the reason for which the parties are contracting. So within the body of the contract, you will have clarity of purpose. Um, you would see, well, we're contracting to produce this band or we're contracting to produce this festival or we're contracting to um, produce this, this carnival conference. Clarity of purpose is usually supplemented by a background clause and this describes the offer and acceptance. So you will see things like, you may see like, whereas party A is a, band is a is a as a carnival band um that that operates in Trinidad and Tobago whereas party B is a costume designer or yeah etc so that's how it would be that's that's the kind of language you would see when you speak to the purpose that they they're contracting for the purpose of doing this particular thing whether that is engaging in the carnival band whether that is um hosting a festival, whatever it is. The duration now speaks to the active time frame of the contract from the beginning to the end. This is also co called the term of the contract, right? Now, sometimes 
you would hear in contract language the same word meaning different things. So term of contract can mean the duration and a term of a contract could also mean a provision or the clause, right? So that's why I said duration, so as not to <laughs> get us too caught up because sometimes we see terms and conditions. That means the clauses that are in the contract as well. So the duration usually gives a statement describing the commencement of the agreement. So this agreement um, as commencing as at this day, blah, 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 between I and D, right? And it usually also describes the end of the agreement. Some obligations in a contract will go beyond the end of the contract for a specified period. And this in particular, I want to point out confidentiality after employment. Remember, I was speaking about utilizing the confidentiality agreements with your team as you're designing, etc. So you want to, it's safe to have a clause inside of there that speaks to um a sunset period, so to speak. So even let's say for two years after you leave, you still are obligated to remain confidential or indefinitely. You mean you're entitled, you're required to remain confidential um, of the information that would have been shared with you. Okay, right. Let's go on to the next essential. We're talking about definitions. Definitions bring clarity. And again, the whole point of this, of putting this contract in black and white, is to have clarity. And the definitions are usually included where there are specific terms used within the agreement that carry a particular meaning, which is sometimes different from the ordinary dictionary meaning, right? So it is particularly useful where contract deals, where the contract deals with subject matter that is outside everyday experience or terms not used in everyday language. This may be very relevant to the carnival and costume, um, carnival and festival costume industry you all may be using um language that we don't use in the everyday language that you may be referring to right specifically if you start you're getting down to let's say design and you're talking about different gauges of wire and all these kinds of things um a definition would be helpful right so it provides clarity to the parties and any third party who may need to interpret. And the best practice, the reference is made to where the defined terms appear first in the agreement. So within the clause, within the, sorry, the, the body of the contract, um, you will have a definitions clause. And it would say, um, healthy means X, Y, Z, as appears in clause three of this contract. So it's telling you where you can identify the, the, the word one time, yeah, within the contract. And so that when you see it, you could also know where to come back in the definitions clause to, to remind yourself or refresh yourself of what does it mean again, right? Because some of us might be new to the contract thing, right? Because we know us creators don't really like to deal with the paper too, too much, but it's how we do the business, right? So... We're overcoming our fears and we're going ahead to essential number four. Essential number four speaks to the um, operative provisions. And this is usually the consideration for the promise and usually includes payment terms and any specific relevance re relative, sorry, to the agreement taking effect, right? So agreement must have for, for a contract to be um, established. There must be an offer. There must be an acceptance. There must be consideration, which is called the promise for the promise, right? I promise to pay you five dollars, and you promise me to give you promise to give me a a, a pass for 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 the soccer drum, right? That's a promise for a promise, right? So that's what you're talking about. When we're talking about the grant of rights, this is where it's very important for us. Once we're talking about passing rights from one party to another, where we're talking about passing our IPRs or inter intellectual property rights. Where the contract entails passing rights from one party to another, the purpose of the contract to be carried out, it must be explicitly stated. So the assignment of the copyright or the granting of a license, which is a permission to do something on specific terms, etc. So you must have that assignment very clearly um, later, that transference must be very clear. Let's go to the next essential. Number six, we talk about the obligations of the party. What are each? What is each party legally bound to do to bring about the purpose of the contract? If I'm coming in with 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 Nicholas as a designer for Wonder, 
what am I contracting to do? I'm contracting to bring us accessories. Then my obligation is to bring X number of accessories by Y date, right? And those must be clearly stated. Best practice is statements of respective responsibilities of the parties are listed separately. So if you are the band producer, the band producer's um, obligations will be listed in one, one, one section. The, sec the section designer, the costume designer for that particular section, it will be listed in, a, their obligations will be listed in another section. That again is just to bring organization, order and clarity to what is being said, right? Because in many instances, the breach of the contract arises from failure of one party to carry out obligations stated in the agreement. And sometimes it's clear simply because, not because they didn't mean to carry it out, you know, it's because they spoke, they didn't write it down and they couldn't remember what their obligations were or their understanding of what was said was different from the other person's understanding. Yeah? And so a party can give notice, bring to the attention of the other party that an obligation is not being carried out and therefore give them a stipulated time frame within which the obligation should be carried out. And if it's not, then the contract is in breach and can be terminated. So as we go on, we talk to warranties and undertaking. So a warranty is a pledge undertaking your endeavor. These are pledges or endeavors that the parties make in relation to the agreement and the ability or intention to do as is stated. So in the case of a, of a costume designer, I am making, I am warranting, I am pledging that I didn't steal anybody's um, copyright. I'm not infringing anybody's copyright in this design that I'm giving to you. Right. And I could undertake to indemnify you from any infringement um, claims that may be made based on the costume that I supply to you, the design that I supply to you. Right. So one party, again, may, may give notice that a warranty or undertaking is not being met and have a stipulated time frame where the obligation should be carried out, failing which the contract can be terminated. All right. Essential number eight, rules apply. So <laughs> notice, we spoke about two instances there just now where parties could give notice, right? And notice in as an essential term in the contract is actually official communication in relation to the contract. So this is not a phone call to say, hey, how are you going? But this is the, this is the letter, the email, or even the phone call, if you determine that that's how you want to get notice, to say, Fella guy, you're supposed to be doing X and you're not doing it. I need you to do it within two weeks or else. Right? And let me just bring to your mind, to, 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 to your remembrance, the obligations that you have. Right? So the notice clause describes how the parties will receive and what will be deemed effective communication. And again, because it is an agreement between persons, you, you generally can come up, you can determine what your effective communication is, right? Parties may include physical mailing address, email, email addresses, and phone numbers. Specifics are important as the addresses used for communication in respect of the agreement may differ from the addresses used in the party's clause, right? So for instance, I may use my, um, my official uh, um, office, um, address for as as in, in the party's clause that I am John McNichol of XYZ place Port of Spain da, 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 da. but for the purpose of receiving notices I may want to use a PO box I may want to use an email address right so we want to be specific about the notice the, the addresses that we're using for the notice and the names of the addresses as well because that may also be different from the parties yeah if you're dealing with a company in particular. So essential number nine, dispute resolution, we fall out. What are we going to do? Are we going straight to court? I beg not. Right? So your dispute resolution clause will, will describe the method by which disputes or disagreements arising on the contracts will be resolved. Come on, for an identified order of how resolution will be addressed is one, Let's try for amicable agreements between the parties. Let's talk it out. Let's work it out. If we can't do that, 
let's go to mediation or conciliation, which is a softer thing where there's a third party, yes, and they're trying to help us to come to agreement. One legally binding, one is not. But if that fails, then maybe we go to arbitration. And if arbitration fails, we go to litigation. I am saying nobody, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, well, I mean, people do it. But when I worked as an attorney, I really didn't like myself when I was doing litigation because you're fighting whole day. You're literally fighting whole day. And then you're also as if you're preparing for an exam every day. It's not a nice place to be. We want to be able to flow creatively and be able to do our do what we're here to do and not be bogged down in court, right? So we want to try for the first or the second um, really hard before we get to the third because it's also costly in time and money, right? So your best practice is to identify a forum and a timeline for arriving at a resolution. For example, if after 30 days, the parties can't come to an applicable resolution, then you go to the next step, right? Um, and I would always, I am, I am a mediation baby. I would always suggest mediation first. Um, and in the process of, in, in where IP is related, the World Intellectual Property Organization also has a forum for um, alternative dispute resolution. So that's also a forum that we can access as owners of intellectual property. And okay, so how and how when when it comes to the end, the contract is it a living contract? Does it go on and on and on and on and on? Probably not. So it's essential to know that the termination is the end of the contract, and the causes you want to know the causes for which the contract may be ended. Right. So the contract may be terminated naturally through the fulfillment of the obligations. I said I was providing you with a a, a costume design by X date. And you would provide me with X amount of money once I've done that. We've both done our part. It can be the contract is terminated, except for those provisions that may continue, like the confidentiality provisions, right? There may also be specific situations which will trigger termination of the contract. Let's say the mass uh I, I become of unsound mind, God forbid, or there's incarceration or the company's go goes bankrupt, um, contracts can be terminated on those causes. It may also include a requirement for notice of termination of a certain time frame. So the termination clause could also speak to the parties have the ability to terminate the contract um, upon giving um, 30 days notice to the next party, right? Um, with or without cause. Right? That's, a, that's a determination that the parties will make, okay? Let's go to number 11. Jurisdiction. Right. So we're living in a global community, right? But we're based somewhere. So what is the jurisdiction or the territory, the country or the state by whose laws the agreement is governed and by which the terms will be interpreted? This also speaks to the courts in which the agreement will be adjudicated and um, should it require, sorry, resolution by a third party. So it's important, very important to consider in terms of knowledge and understanding of the law of the jurisdiction, as well as management of costs of enforcement, right? Don't jump up and go and do a U.S. based, a U.S. law um, contract because, you know, you think it, it makes you sound all nice and fancy. But then if you get sued, do you even know an attorney in the U.S.? Can you afford litigation in the U.S.? What state in the U.S. is, 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 um, laws that you're dealing with is it federal is it federal is it state what you know so be strategic when you're considering the jurisdiction if you're trading in other up in other or in other countries in other territories then you may definitely have to trade um contract in those jurisdictions if you're licensing with a country with a company let's say from from um Indonesia or somebody or, or somewhere else to, to, to make costumes or something else or to distribute country um costumes too. They may send you the contract and it may be based on their um jurisdiction, right? So there's a consideration that you have to have. And generally there's always some information that you may need to get if it's a different jurisdiction, right? And that's what the attorneys are there for to help you with. Right. Essential number 12. 
I cannot tell you how often I have come across, it's 102, I cannot tell you how often I have come across contracts that have not been signed and people are coming to me to enforce it. But the contract not signed or signed by one person. So all the parties to the agreement are required to sign it. This ensures that all parties acknowledge, accept and agree to the terms of the contract to which the signature is affixed. You also want to ensure, yes, really, really. <laughs> Also, another opportunity to ensure that the person duly authorized to enter the agreement is in fact the one signing the agreement. You're dealing with a company, the driver bring the contract for you, the driver sign the contract. Can the, the driver bind the company? Probably not. If it's a larger company, if it's a, if it's a business or a smaller company and the driver is also the sole shareholder, then yeah, he can. But you need to have the duly authorized person to sign the agreement, right? Best practice, include a name, a designation, and functional reference. The party should also initial each page of the contract preceding the signature page, right? So when you're dealing with your contracts, you want to know your audience, tailor your language to suit the parties. Contracts can be done in letter form as well as standard form contracts. Clarity is what you're going for. The contract should provide clarity of all provisions to the parties as well as any third party who may have to interpret the agreement. And you're looking for workable agreements. Draft in consideration of potential problems. When you're thinking about it, what could potentially go wrong? And work backwards and engineer your contract to do that. The aim is to be able to perform the contract and avoid litigation. So, some expert tips, you start with a blank piece of paper, make an outline. You want to map out the agreement before beginning to draft, starting with the end in mind. And of course, you want to be informed. So you want to research any relevant information um, that is there. Um, and I had alluded to um, something that you would get if you would be good and complete the survey at the end um, or when the survey comes to you. And what that is, is a mind map, right? So it's a contract mind map that basically lays out how you would think about contracts, whether you are preparing one or reviewing one, using utilizing these essential tools. So that's it for me at this point in time. We are at 105. I don't know if we are going to engage in questions or you tell me. Thank you so much, Dion and Nicholas a well, very, very engaging presentation. And you taught me something. So you, you have given me ideas for when I do my presentation. So thank you very much. You learn every day. And thank you to the participants for their comments and their questions and making this a very interactive uh, session. I don't know how much longer we have on the Connect America's platform. We seem to be out of time, but if someone has a burning question, please, you have exactly two minutes to write it in the chat or put it in the q and I'm seeing looking forward to part two. While uh, um while while <laughs> persons up, uh, if they're getting their questions ready, I just wanted to do a, a like a thirty second recap of everything Wonderful. right so in in taking away from this presentation everyone i want us to remember two sets of abbreviations the first one is tic tick these are the rights that we we covered today trademarks industrial design and copyright these are the rights that are most suited to this particular industry tic tick then I want you to remember the, the letters CPU. We are familiar with CPU, but in this context, CPU is going to apply to everything across this presentation. Creation, protection, and usage. You create your intellectual property by putting it in a physical form. You protect it by seeking out the intellectual property rights, the TIC. And in terms of the U, the U comes down to the exploitation and the commercialization. It is all about the usage who uses it, what is being used, how it is being used, and where it is being used. So TIC, trademark, industrial design, copyright, and CPU, create, protect, and use. Thank you 
so much, Nicholas. I'm seeing Mr. Williams. I'm seeing your camera on. So I don't know if you want to say anything on behalf of the IDB or Connect Americas. I'm putting you on the spot, I know. <laughs> I just want to say thank you all again for an excellent presentation. Um, I'm here taking copious notes and I just want to reiterate our commitment at IDB to support development throughout all of the industries in Trinidad and Tobago. So thank you all. Thank you for everyone that came on. And part two is something in the woodwork. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. I am seeing Mr. Asgar Ali. Thank you, Dr. Legol. I really want to thank the IDB for its collaboration, the first of its kind in this area. Our facilitators, dynamic presentation. Uh, also want to thank Ms. Lorinda Passat from the IPO who was firing away answers on the chat as well, and the whole team uh, for putting this together. And we really hope it would be the first of many to come um, going forward. So thanks again. It, I guess it's a wrap. <laughs> I think it's a wrap. I think I it's think a wrap. It's... I don't know if Ms. Coburn is around or maybe she had to leave. Okay, great. Well, Mr. Williams filled that, that, that those shoes for us. So I want to thank everyone again for taking the time to join us for this session. And we are um, anticipating um, part two as well. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I was happy to moderate this session. Thank and you. don't forget to complete the survey, okay? And don't forget to follow the links that have been placed in the chat giving you more information about what we spoke about today, as well as you will be given a link to a recording of this presentation and you will be contacted by Connect Americas in that regard. So until we meet again, be safe and be well. Take good care. Bye everyone. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you.